How's it going? <laughs> uh, third service, just before we do anything else, I got to let you know that we are recording this service for everybody online. Uh, we had some technical difficulties during second, so you online audience that suffered through everything that we did to you this morning, thank you for tuning back in and being a part of this. So um, I know that this service can sometimes be a little bit uh, sassy on the sassy side, um, so I'm not going to tell you to hold back. I'd I just appreciate you being extra. Would you be extra today? <laughs> amen, amen. Let's be extra. It's, it, it's great. Um, I, just first thing I want to say before we uh, go into prayer and go into this morning's message, uh, we did 21 days of prayer and fasting, and that was done last Sunday. And somebody approached me this, this last week and said, we didn't officially announce that it was the end of 21 days of prayer and fasting. So if you're still fasting today, I just want to tell you that, yeah, I'm just joking. I know you're done. I know that we're all done. Um, but I do want to celebrate what God did during 21 days of prayer and fasting. Because at the very beginning of the year, we made him number one. And he, he is first in our lives. And, and as we sought God, we sought him for him. And he gave us breakthrough and he gave us answers. And he gave us, in, in many cases, the miracles that we were asking him for. But let me just encourage you that no matter what you received from God during that time, what God really wanted for you at the end of it he wanted you to reconnect with him. Like you think about Jesus. Jesus did a lot of miracles for people. Amen. He did, he did a lot of miraculous things to bless people. But behind every single one of them, what he was actually after was a reconnection between him and that person. God wants relationship. He wants to be your number one. So if you got a miracle like that, you had an amazing time during our 21 days of prayer and fasting, could I just ask you, would you uh, look at the QR code that's in your program, in your bulletin there, and there's an opportunity for you to go to a web form, and you can do this online as well. It's going to be in the chat for you, and you can share your testimony of how God worked in your life during the 21 days, because we're coming back to this again next January as a church. And I think some of the stories, some of the miraculous stories that happen in your family, God may want those stories to inspire someone next year. So would you just take a couple minutes and write that down? Also last week, we were gone on an elder retreat and we do this every few years. We take our church leadership away. We get out of state. Um, we went to a ranch in Texas. We rode some horses and threw some tomahawks and no one was killed. Thank God. Uh, we survived the whole thing and we got closer as a leadership team and God bless so much. But we, we, what we do is we get away for an entire weekend and we just get quiet. And we talk about just a few really big issues in the church um, because a lot of times we don't have the time that we would want to give to them. And so we fasted and prayed and spent a lot of time talking about these topics. And you're going to hear more about them in the coming year, just some of the ways that God broke through for us and spoke some really precious things for our church. Um, lots coming to you. Um, and last week we had Pastor Jonathan here and he spoke on communication. Was anybody there for that? Anybody have a good time with Pastor Jonathan here? Um, I'm so thankful that you guys embraced him and welcomed him. Um, I will tell you, uh, he, so he spoke on communication. We're a messy matrimony. He was week three on, on communication. I heard a lot of really good things about him. And whenever you're selecting uh, guest pastors to come in and preach, you want somebody that's good so that everybody has a good time. But also you don't want to choose anybody that's too good. And someone did say something. Someone wrote me an email about how good he was. And I was just a little bit offended. My, like my, my ego was struggling. So next time, we, next time I'm out of town, we have Pastor Jonathan in. I've selected a passage from the book of Leviticus for him to teach to you. Some Old Testament genealogies thrown in. It's going to be a very exciting time for everybody involved. And that'll get him. Okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for fun. We thank you for Super Bowl Sunday, God. We thank you for all the things. And Jesus, we pray that you would come into this time, Lord, this holy time, God. And the reason it's holy, God, is because where two or more are gathered, you are here in our midst. It is your presence, Lord, that we are here for. We're here to have an experience of God, Lord. We don't just want information. God, we need your power today. Because God, as we talk about our relationships, God, we know what it is to try harder, Lord. We know what it is to read one more book and have none of it work. So we're asking for 
God power today to be brought to bear on our romantic relationships, Jesus, would you help us? In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay, so the, the very first thing I need you to do is take out your programs um, and or bulletins, whatever you want to call them, and there are blank lines on the back of them. Take that out, and there's a pen on the seat back in front of you. So take out the pen as well. I need you to write some things down. This is going to be an interactive first section. It's super, super important. Please don't skip this, because if you can do this first part right, the whole rest of the message is going to be more punchy for you. So here's what you're going to do. Take that pen, take that paper, and I want you to write down two columns. The first column is you. The second column is them. So it's the other person, it's the other partner in your relationship. Now, if you're single today, just put one column there, and that's totally fine because you're going to learn some things about yourself, and it's going to be good. So what we're doing is we're going to write down some attributes of you. And this is going to give you a little bit of a profile of yourself. So the very first attribute I want to show you, it's on your screen, is are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? Now, don't oversimplify it. It's not about shyness. An introvert is somebody who needs to be alone in order to rebuild themselves and to get strong when they're stressed out. An extrovert likes to be around people and they energize them. Which are you? Which are you? And which is your partner? Write those things down. Next, and I'm not going to give you a lot of time to think about this. Are you an internal processor or an external processor? And what are they? By external processor, what I mean is that if you're going through something emotional or difficult, what you've got to do is you've got to talk the entire thing out loud in the presence of somebody in order to process through it. Some of you are that external kind, and some of you want to go into a quiet room and shut the door and just think about it. If in your relationship, you're the person who's like, I just want some quiet so I can think about it, you're an internal processor. Next, are you a feeler or a thinker? Are you logicking the problem or are you feeling the problem? And the way you talk about it, is it all about the feelings? Next, are you a planner or are you spontaneous? And what's your partner? Are you a spender or a saver? That's the next one. Everybody laughs at this one. All three services. And some of you are are now trying to hide your list from from your partner. (laughs) The next one. When you cook in the kitchen, do you wash all the pans as you go? Or do you wash them all at the end? Or never, never is an option as well. Just wash them never. (laughs) And then finally, if you came into a bunch of money, would you go for a bigger house or a bigger vacation? Or a bigger car? (laughs) Okay, now stand back from your list for just a second. Take a look at it. How similar are you and your partner? A lot of differences? See, opposites, absolute opposites. Okay, here's one final attribute I want you to write down. What is your fighting style? And I'm going to give you some fighting styles to choose from. Number one, are you a screamer? That means any emotion at all. It is out loud. It is in your face. We are going to get the bad juju out. Screamers. Some of you guys grew up with that, and so that's how it's done. Screamers. Next, are you a sulker? That means the fight starts and you're going to go escape into a room somewhere because you don't want to deal with it. And you might have your reasons for why you say you're leaving and escaping and you sort of quietly want them to come find you. And we all know that. Next is stuffers. Stuffers are going to say, even though it's really emotional, even though it's really painful, they're going to say, I'm okay. I'm okay. You're okay. We're okay. Everybody's okay. And we all know that we're not okay, right? That's the stuffers. Peace needers. I don't say peacemakers. Peace needers. You need there to be peace. You need everybody to be shaking hands and hugging and everybody on the same page. That's what you need. And if you don't have that, that, that disunity in the family, people, people uh, 
not liking each other, that keeps you up at night because you need there to be peace. And, and what's tough about that is sometimes you need it so much that it starts to become a bit of a control thing for you and you don't get actual peace at the end. So you don't make peace, you just needed it. And then lastly, litigators, uh, you were on the debate team in school. You're really a lawyer whether you got the title or not. You argue everything so well, and you think that you win each time. Where are my litigators at? You think you win each time. So did you write them down? Did you write you down? And look again at that list. And here's how I feel about that list when I look at our list. Is God, why did you do this to us? Why did you make us so different? Does anybody feel that? Like, Okay, so first story about Linda and I, and I'm going to give you several stories about Linda and I today, just so that you can um, analyze our relationship and hopefully either get some laughs or learn some things about your own. Um, all these have been cleared by Linda. So the very first one, <laughs> very first one is we had only been married maybe four or five months, and we were at our duplex at Goodfield, Illinois, and we were in the master bedroom. And she's sitting down on the floor with a basket of laundry, and she's folding the laundry. And I'm in the same room, and I'm up on the bed uh, near the pillows, and we're sitting there talking. And as we talk, we're getting more and more frustrated with each other, and it turns into a fight. And later, what we learned about each other is that she was really hoping that I would come down and help her with the basket of laundry. And I was hoping that she would come up to the pillows... And we'd have a little bit of me time. You know what I'm saying? We wanted two different things. And often in our relationships, we want two different things. And we're coming from two different directions. And I remember going and having some time with God because I was walking with God in those days. And saying, God, why? Why would you make this so hard? Like, why would you make us so different? It's almost, God, like you stacked the deck against us. And I felt like God's word came back to me so clearly in that moment and said, you know, Josh, this is the only way I can teach you how to love. I'm going to use her to teach you. And by the way, you're kind of a selfish guy and you need it. <laughs> Amen. I did need it. But we struggle. I've got a picture of us when we first got married up there. There it is. So young, so cute. And they couldn't have any problems, right? And they think they've got it all together. And they think everybody else has done this wrong and we're going to do it right. And they're wrong about all of it, those two people. They were wrong about all of it. <laughs> Just like you're wrong about all of it or you were wrong about all of it. So God, why would you do this to us? And, and answer number one is to teach you how to love. And you'll see this in Proverbs 27, 17. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. That's a good marriage verse right there. Iron sharpens iron. Do you see the friction in that, in that picture? That's not an easy process. That's not a smooth process. And it's not one dominant. It's two equals. Two pieces of iron come together. And they sharpen each other over time, through conflict. It's a conflict verse. God wants to teach you how to love. You are two equals. There is no dominant party. There is no alpha dog in your relationship. We talked about Galatians 5 a couple of weeks ago. Submit to each other in reverence for Christ. He is the alpha dog in your relationship. Can I get a better amen? Amen. amen. And I was a selfish guy. I still am a selfish guy, but I was really a selfish guy. And I thought I was such a great Christian. I thought I was so unselfish. I thought I was going to have the best marriage ever because I was so ready. And God had to show me what the reality was. Next, next answer, God, why did you do this to us? To help us see our blind spots. You don't know what you don't know. And the things you can't see, you don't know that you can't see those things. So it takes somebody else with a different pair of eyes to show you. So Proverbs 16, 2 says, people may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. 
What a great conflict verse. Like you just might, the author of, uh, of Proverbs is saying, you just might think that all your motives in this particular fight are pure. They're not. And God knows and God can examine you and God often will use your partner to show you what your blind spots are. And that is a massive, massive strength. See, we're better together. We're also a team. Do you know you're a team? You look at those two lists and like they're one way and you're another way. And that's a source of friction, but it also is a source of strength if you're a team. Like we've got a, we've got a little game being played this afternoon. Yes? Super Bowl? I wore my, my sports t-shirt <laughs> just to be in support of all of you. Still don't know who the teams are today, but that's okay. But they're going to be a team. And here's the thing. All the members of the team, you don't want that team to, to have all the same kinds of people on the team. Like you need some people who are 350 pounds, super strong, but not everybody. Maybe you need four of those guys. You need someone who's really skinny, really fast, can really run, can really catch a ball. It's a ball, right? Is that the, what the, they're using? Or it's, a, it's a ball. They can catch a ball. And then you need somebody else who's super tall and can make snap decisions and can pass really well. But you don't need everybody to have the same skill set, right? And I know there's 11 full players and I haven't named them all and I don't know the rest of them, but you get kind of the point. Is it possible that when God says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. That joining that God did on your wedding day, is it possible that, that in that joining, he was making a team? That he was bringing your differences together in his way so that you would be stronger together than you were apart? I think that's possible. Next. Why would God do this to us? Answer, so you could choose that person all over again. You chose him once. You need to choose him again. Song of Songs 6, 8. I would still choose my dove, my perfect one, the favorite of her mother, dearly loved by the one who bore her. I would still choose you. You know what Tuesday is, right? <laughs> Valentine's? It's not too late, guys. It's almost too late, but it's not too late. You're filling out that card, say, I would still choose you. Song of songs, put the reference there for extra points. That's definitely extra points there. I would still choose you. I love that idea. No matter what we've been through, I would still choose you. And no matter what we're going through right now, I would still choose you. And how is that an anti-conflict message? Because most of the time in a conflict, we're not choosing them. We're choosing us. And what you're saying is, I refuse to choose me. I choose you. And I'm willing to go through this, whatever this is, because I choose you. Even when you're annoying to me, I choose you. Even when you've brought me to the very brink of insanity, I choose you. <laughs> Even though you, you're acting like your father right now. Even though you're acting like your mother right now, which you should never say that stuff out loud, ever, ever, ever. But I still choose you. It's, it's important. God still chooses us, doesn't he? Don't we want that from each other? It's, it's, it's deeply what we want. And, and think about a soldier for a second. A, full, a soldier goes off to war and a soldier fights for their country. And often when a soldier fights for their country, do you know they come back more of a patriot than when they started? Because there's something that happens inside of the human heart that when you fight for something, it deepens the bond you have with that thing. Some of you parents have fought for your kids. You've had to fight for your kids. And when you came to the end of it, your bond with your kids was even stronger than it had ever been before because you had to fight. And some of you are listening to that and you're like, we've had so much fighting in our relationship. Why isn't our bond stronger? And the answer is because you're not fighting for each other. You're fighting against each other. You stopped fighting for each other a long time ago. And Jesus talked about this. Remember Mark 
chapter, chapter three, it's not on the screens, but he says, if a house is divided against itself, it can't stand. You can't be divided as a house. And you notice he didn't talk about you and he didn't talk about her. He talked about us. He just called you a family there, a house, a unit, a team. If a team is divided against itself, then divorce is coming. It's the division that happens long before the divorce. And so we can't be against each other. See, that, that, that very simple phrase Jesus says, that is the scriptural core of this message. Jesus went right after it. He said, in your conflicts, you can't be against each other. Because if you're fighting against, you'll be divided. And if you're divided, you'll collapse. We all need to hear that today. Divided house leads to a divorced house. So let's get more practical. James chapter 4 verse 1. James does not pull punches. James is going to go after us. He is going to x-ray all of our conflicts. And he's got amazing insight. He's going to take Jesus's one-liner and just essentially expand it. Here's what James is about to do. James chapter 4 verse 1. He says, what is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And I'm going to pause this right there because he's already given us three essential points in fighting well. So here's how to fight well in your relationship. First off, you want what you don't have. You need to admit to yourself and to the other person that there are things that you want. You're like, well, I can't think of what I want in the fight. I know, because you think you're right. Admitting what you want is very, very different than believing that you have the moral high ground in the fight and that you're right and they're wrong. That's where most of us live. Are we too deep here? Are we okay? Right? Like most of the fights that you have, this is how I'm right and this is how you're wrong and I feel superior to you because I'm the right one. This is how our fights go. James says that's actually wrong. That's actually you positioning yourself for control and for power. He said, if I pull back everything and I x-ray your fight, you actually want something. And so do they. And as soon as you start to admit to yourself that you want something, all of a sudden you become equals and all of a sudden you start to negotiate because nobody's got the moral high ground anymore. So that's step one. You've got to admit what it is that you want. The next step that he gives us is he tells us that we're fighting and waging war against each other. We're hurting each other. We want what we want so badly that we're willing to hurt the other person. And that's where he's reflecting Jesus' words of you're being against them. You've got to stop being against them. And once you start admitting to yourself that there's a thing that you want here, you've got to make a conscious decision that I'm not going to hurt this person to get what I want. Why? Because they're too valuable. Because you chose them. Because you love them. And you love them more than this thing that you want. Third point, James is so good. He says, because you don't ask God for it. So he's saying that thing that you want, that thing that you're hurting them for, you're trying to squeeze something out of your partner that they were ne never meant to give you. And that's unfair. You've got to stop. You've got to instead, once you, once you can start to reflect and realize what it is that you want in the middle of the fight, you've got to realize you've got to go to God for that. See, we talked a couple of weeks ago about dating and about how sometimes one of the ways that we reflect on whether or not a partner is a good partner to have is are they okay in and of themselves? Are they enough? Are they healthy? Do you guys remember that? You know how you're healthy as a person, as a single person? You find everything that you need in God. That's the source of health. I'm enough in him. 
And the things that I desperately need, I find in him. And sometimes when we enter a romantic relationship, we lose our minds and we start to forget that. We start to think that I'm supposed to find the things that I want in this person. And you're actually making them into an idol. And it's not good. And it's too burdensome on them. And you're going to end in frustration. You're like, well, that sounds super spiritual and super lofty. And I'm not sure how to find... Here's a question. Do you go into the marriage and say, you know what? Everybody else in my family left me. I'm going to marry someone who will never leave me. Do you know what you just did? You just put an unreasonable expectation on a sinful person. They can't measure up. You're like, but the things that I demand, the things that I want, they're just so basic. (sighs) But we're so broken. You got two people in a broken marriage, two sinners. What chance do we have, guys? And this, this this is just the source of so many of the things that just won't let themselves go. Everybody else let me down. No one else loved me the way that I needed to be loved. No one else provided for me the way I needed to be provided for. And you're going to do it all. Let's get married. Oh, God, help us. Do you see what James is saying? He's like, listen, you should have gone to God for that. And that's not meant to just shut you up. He means actually go pray and ask God for those things. And proactively, as you ask God for those things, you're going to stop putting these unreasonable expectations on your spouse that they can never meet. So let's read the next verse. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong because you want only what will give you pleasure. That thing that you want, you should have gotten it from God. And oh, by the way, your motives were wrong because essentially it was selfish in the first place. You should be less about you and more about us. More about our team. Less Josh, less Linda, more team true blood. You know what I mean? Like, like we've, got to, we've got to work toward the house and the unity and the health of the house. And we have to fight for it. And we got to keep that focus. And James says, and if you can't keep that focus, then you need to go to God in prayer and you need to ask for new motives. Oh gosh. You have an autopilot set in your heart that points toward you. So do I. You can't change the autopilot. Only God can. This is the gospel, is that we are all broken sinners and we can't fix us. You ever tried to fix you before? How many self-help books before you finally gave up? It doesn't work. You can't change your own heart. Only Jesus can. That's why he died for us. He He didn't die for us and offer salvation to the people who figured it out who worked hard enough, got themselves religious enough, he offered it to us as free grace because it was our only shot. He died for your marriage. He died for your relationship. And he wants to change your motive, but it's gonna be a work of God. Okay, so out of the book of James, I'm gonna take this down to a three-point peace plan. Here's how to fight biblically. Number one, admit what you want. You actually got to say it out loud and you've got to know what it is. Again, that's the, it's not because I'm right. Because I'm right doesn't work. And if you can admit what it is that you want and more specifically the cocktail of what you want, because you actually want a lot of things, there's a lot motivating you, then you can finally start to negotiate as equals. Again, Submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. He is the alpha. We are not. Negotiate as equals. And then part three, pray for surrender. Whenever I get to sit down with couples and talk about conflict, they'll talk about the first two steps and then what they'll say is, and it didn't work. Always. And it didn't work. That's why you need the third step. Because what you do is you go to God and you say, God, I need you to make me neutral. If you're taking notes, write that down. Make me neutral. 
because I do want something and they want something. And God, you need to work on my heart and make me neutral. Make me let it go, Elsa. Let it go, that thing. You know what I'm saying? Let it go. You have to. Because when you let it go, what you're saying is, I care more about Linda than I do this thing. That's the letting go. And only God can do that in you. So many fights that Linda and I have gone through, and it's like, and we couldn't agree, and we couldn't agree. It's like, okay, split up and go back and pray more. Split up and go back and pray more. You're like, well, that sounds like really time consuming. It is. Resolution is way more time consuming than fights. But it's way more healthy. Okay, I'm going to tell you the legend of the Kirby vacuum. Anybody have a vacuum seal salesman ever come to your house? Come on, admit it. Yes, yes, yes. Got a couple of you. Okay. So again, this was in the first year of our, our, our marriage. And I got, I got two big stories for you to finish us up. But the first story is going to be when we didn't do anything that James told us to do. Uh, the second one, we got a little bit of it more right. So the first one is the legend of the Kirby vacuum. And um, here's what happened is this vacuum guy came and all the promises, super expensive vacuum, right? Like really wants to sell you. And this deal is only so good for like the next few hours or whatever else. And, and and, and what's perfect about this vacuum, and he demonstrates it and all this kind of stuff, is that every speck of dust in your entire house will be removed by this vacuum. It's just that good. And I had an allergy to dust. And so Linda, I mean, we're in the first year, and, and, and it's like, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hit this home run and get this great vacuum that's going to help Josh and all this kind of stuff. And I come home in the middle of the presentation, and I don't want the vacuum. The vacuum's too expensive for me. It's going to be a payment plan. I don't want a payment plan. Like all of this kind of stuff. And she and I are at odds. Salesmen don't care, by the way. <laughs> they just want the sale. They don't care what happens to the two of you. And they set it up for a sale. They don't set it up for your unity. And so... It was a very, very trying evening in our house. We did not buy a vacuum. And I did not win. I lost. For weeks and weeks and weeks, I lost. It was not, it was not good. And I thought I had the moral high ground. Right? Like, we didn't pray about it. We couldn't talk about it because he's in there in the house. Everything worked, worked against us. We didn't do anything James said. And I thought I had the moral high ground because it's like, I don't want to go into debt. See, see, that's so good. See, and she wants to help me. See, and here's the thing. After weeks and weeks and weeks and probably a few months, what started to come out in me as the Lord started to analyze my heart is that part of the reason I didn't want to say yes to this thing, and I don't really regret not saying yes, I, but but I had a mix of emotions, right? Like part of what was in there is I, I don't like being taken advantage of. I don't like getting cheated because the men in my life that I respect have all these great stories in their life of, of times that they didn't get cheated. And I'm a new guy in a new marriage and I want to be big. And that was in there for me. Were there good motives in me? Yes. But these other things were there too. And do you think those other things added some intensity to the way that I was dealing with this woman that I loved? And the fact that I wasn't admitting that that cocktail was there, it, you know what I'm saying. It's not helpful. We went to some marriage mentors and they helped, helped us kind of unpack the whole thing and kind of figure it out. And one of their piece of advice to us is they're like, you need a pre-fight plan. They're like, get a pre-fight plan. And our pre-fight plan from that point forward became, we will never make a big financial decision unless we've had 24 hours to fully go through it together and get unity. And if we don't have unity, we won't do it. But if we're ever in a situation where someone says, you've got to sign this today, it's an automatic no for us. The reason it's an automatic no is because we can't do James. We can't do those steps. And I've given up a lot of good sales and good business opportunities 
and I have loved my wife instead, she's worth it. I choose her. She's just more important. Okay, next, the, the legend of the house cleaning perfection. So we had three kids under three years old, and that's for real. It was a lot. And Linda decides to stay home and to love the kids, teach the kids, work with the kids. And I'm working during the day, and I have this expectation of Martha Stewart house perfection. <laughs> I didn't know that that was unhealthy at the time. I thought that's just what everybody did. It's in all the magazines. What's the problem? <sighs> it wasn't so great. And, and here's the thing. As we fought over this, and oh my goodness, the, just the sheer number of hours of discussion that went into this issue, we took our time. And it was worth it to us to just continue to loop the discussion and go back to prayer and go back to prayer and try to negotiate and try not to take the high ground with each other. You know, because that's where you start, right? Like I started with like, hey, order is good. Come on, people. People don't need to take responsibility. Come on. And of course, she's saying things like, Josh, I've seen moms who are more focused on a perfect house than they are on their own kids. And kids feel that. And kids know that. And I'm not going to raise my kids that way. And we had to we had to find a negotiating point over time. We had to understand each other over time. Even her saying that phrase, do you know how many weeks it took us before she even said that phrase out loud and boom, I could understand it? It's hard. Isn't it hard? Because you think, so we negotiated. And I do believe that people taking responsibility for the messes that they make and the chaos that they make is good. Amen? I get an amen from some of you. And so we negotiated and we said certain rooms of the house. I don't know about better be spotless, but there need to be responsibility in those rooms. In other rooms, they were okay for chaos. And my goodness, my inner perfectionism, it had to bow to my love for my wife. And that was a good day. And that was worth doing. Okay, we'll finish up. I've got five fumbles for you. Ultra practical. If you're a note taker, I'm not going to go down through all of these. We're out of time. Don't dominate, though. Don't get loud. Don't threaten. Don't use cutting words that you know better should not be used. Your goal is not to dominate and be alpha. Jesus is alpha. Don't bring up their history. You did this in 1982. There's such a pattern with you. You always, you never. Don't say those things. Like these are just things that will just make the whole thing so much harder. Very, very practical. Make some rules for yourself. Stay away from these things. Definitely don't bring in the in-laws. Can I get a better amen on that? Don't bring in the in-laws ever, ever. And don't, don't run to the in-laws and don't bring the in-laws into your fights. Don't ever do that. That's divided loyalties. That doesn't work. And no electronic fights. And you're like, but I used emojis. That doesn't matter. No, no amount of emojis makes it okay. What you just tried to say there, do it face to face. Body language is huge. Tone is huge. And the hug that you give them at the end is huge. Five fumbles, five field goals. Fight for us. Not you. You ever play, play capture the flag? Capture the flag, it, 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 like you go to camp, they're going to play it, right? You paintballers out there, they're going to play it. You're going to have a fort, there's going to be a flag, everybody's defending your fort. There's another fort out there, and they're all defending their flag, and the whole game is who will defeat who. It's war. In every single one of your marriages, 
there's a Josh Fort and there's a Linda Fort. And what we forget is the third Fort, which is us. We got to fight for us. We've got to plant ourselves at us as a team. And we got to fight for that because it's more important. This is not self help. Jesus loves us, and we have no chance outside of him. Can I get an amen? Amen. He is the, he is the one who changes human hearts. Would you guys stand? He's the only one that can heal us from the words we've already said to each other. He's the only one who can wash away the bitterness of your past. He's the only one who can take your broken marriage and so broken right now and put it on a whole new level. He's the only one that can do that. And a huge part of it is that autopilot inside of you. It's got to change. And we're not religious people here. We don't end messages by saying, that's why you got to work harder. That's why you got to try. You can't. Amen? Come on, folks. We need him. So what we're going to do is pray. What we're going to do is surrender. What we're going to do is say, Jesus, you can come in and shift around anything you want to shift. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray for healing. God, everything we're about to pray for, it's all supernatural. God, this isn't self-help, God, because we can't help ourselves. God, we can't do anything. Not really. We've tried. And so, God, we come and our hope is all in you. So, Jesus, we ask for a miracle today over, over our relationship. We ask for a miracle. God, some of us are healing from, mir- from, from relationships in our past. And God, that person isn't even around anymore for us. God, we need healing today from that relationship. God, I pray for healing today. God, some of us are single today and we're hearing all this stuff today in church. And we're like, I don't know that I ever want to get married. This sounds hard. Lord, I pray for hope. Because our hope is in you. God, you've got a wonderful plan for us. And we love you, Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen.